All right, welcome everybody. I have a very special episode of The Film Room this week. Uh, it's special because I'm in a very bad microphone right now, as you can probably <laughs> tell. Uh, compared to my guest, Christopher Harris, you know him from the Harris Football Podcast. It's the biggest and best fantasy football podcast on the web. Uh, tens and tens of thousands of people listen to him every single day, every single week to get advice. And he nails it. And he nails it because he follows a mantra that very few fantasy professionals do, which is that tape rules everything just like we do here on the film room and uh i love that that philosophy it's a philosophy i follow and i really hope that if you fancy players that listen to this collaboration first collaboration we've done on this channel i hope that you guys follow that philosophy too because the eye in the sky never lies but numbers do so chris want you to introduce yourself and uh, welcome to the film room Oh, thanks for having me, Brett. Uh, it's awesome. This is really fun. I mean, you said it before we started recording. It's like I do five podcasts a week and talk about all these players and what I see on film, but I don't really, you know, the listeners don't ever get to see me actually talking about a specific play and sort of follow along. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's going to be really cool. Absolutely. Spreading the gospel of, of film, as I say. The All-22 <laughs> is the best thing out there. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about one running back and one receiver from a fantasy perspective, supported by tape, that we absolutely love for this season. Uh, they're undervalued by a lot of people, or at least compared to <laughs> where, where I would value them. Uh, I think they're going to have huge seasons. So let's kick it off with our running back. It's going to be uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers stud. Doug Martin, he's missing the first few games of the year with a suspension, but he is healthy, he is ready to go, and as soon as he is back on the field, I expect him to tear it up. So why don't you give me your opinion on Doug Martin? So even before I start breaking anything down filmically, I mean, anybody who's listened to me talk from ESPN days and now on my own knows that I have a major affinity for Doug Martin, but I actually don't have him rated as highly as you do, and I want to. I'm so mad at myself, Brett. You're like the brave one. <laughs> and and I'm just like the wimp, you know, I am. Uh, I'm going to get him on my teams no matter you, what. I'm yeah, you him. are. You are. I mean, because you can get it. <laughs> you're going to take him in the fifth or sixth round, right? I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, he's, he's a slam dunk fifth round pick to me. So you're going to get him and, and at, at that price in most leagues. And it could work out with a first round value. It absolutely could. You saw it two years ago. I'll just say before we start breaking his film down saying why we like the talent so much, I'll give my reasoning for why I'm more in alignment with the market and it's nothing about the talent. I wish we could just draft entirely based on talent, but situations matter and especially a running back who has been basically sabotaged fantasy seasons three of the last four years with injury and I don't know how you feel about it, but soft tissue injuries. Those are the ones that Maybe really I'm biased. Maybe I'm biased because the one... The one year that he didn't sabotage himself and he finished as a top five running back was the year that I drafted him. That's right. Well, and, <laughs> so, and his rookie year, he was great too. So he's had two unbelievable fantasy years, right? And then he's had, unfortunately, three out of the last four where it was crushed. It's the soft tissue injuries. And I said this to you before when we were talking about Martin and who, like who we should be talking about and stuff. For me, the soft tissue injuries, when, when then the player turns out to have been on PEDs, I go, ugh. It's so related, you know, and I go, could it recur? Could it? There's a lot of stuff swirling around in my head about Martin. I just in general, philosophically, I'm just curious because I wish I could be where you are on a player I like so much. Like, at, is there a point at which someone like Martin would burn you to the point where like, no, I can no longer spend the fourth or the fifth because I'm there. I mean, yeah, I Arian Foster got to that point pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. It's even though I'm a Texans comparison. fan, yeah. even though I'm a Texans fan, you know, I would always take him two rounds early just because I love the dude. Yeah. And I mean, it worked for a while and then it didn't. And yeah. it, it sucked. But the reason why I'm willing to take chances on these high upside mid round running backs is because I do so much tape work on the college players when I do draft videos and, and all that kind of stuff that mm -hmm. usually I have a pretty good idea about the rookie running back class, which is where I get all of my value. Hmm. All, all the time, it's where I get running back value as rookies every single season. Yeah. So I'm okay with taking Martin around early and taking on that risk because I'm confident in myself to come back and get a rookie, you know, two, three, eight rounds later hmm. that, that, can, that can fill in that gap if I get burned. And sometimes it works. Actually, most of the time it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it works more than it doesn't, which is why I still do it. But 
as long as you're confident in your ability to identify rookie contributors, which is the best discount you're ever going to get because nobody knows how good they are yet. If you can nail rookie contributors in the late rounds, you can take risky stuff in the early rounds. That's mm. my philosophy. Who, who's the one? Who, who am I missing? Like in the, say, in the second half of the draft? <laughs> well, it was Kareem Hunt until Spencer Ware got hurt. <laughs> yeah, it's not him anymore. <laughs> Elijah Hood. It's not Elijah Hood, I assume. No, I was kind of on that Joe Joe Williams bandwagon for a while, and then Carlos mm. Hyde came out, and, and he killed it, so I'm kind of softer on that. Jamal um, Williams? Maybe, maybe, but I, I other than goal line work, I'm not sure if he's going to get the workload that Montgomery will. I feel like Montgomery's going to get more of the carries, but mm. Williams is going to get carries inside the five, mm. which kind of hurts both of their values. But if you're in a PPR, Montgomery's still going to get a bunch of catches, so it kind of makes up for it. Um but it's weird. This year, the rookies are getting drafted way higher than they normally do. And maybe right. it's because Zeke Elliott kind of tainted that supply a little bit in terms of, you know, he was a first round pick that actually worked out for a while. You could get rookies really cheap because Trent Richardson busted everybody. But now once Zeke worked out when he was a first round pick, now you're seeing Leonard Fournette go in the second. You're seeing Joe Mixon go in the fifth. You're seeing Kareem Hunt's now going in the fifth or sixth. You know, it's hard to find the rookie value at running back this year because everybody's everybody's kind of overdrafting him. Mm, it's but, it's a but, little bit frustrating. Dang it, Brett's taking Doug Martin anyway. <laughs> I, I mean, I might as well, right? Yeah. All right, so well, let's talk about why we like him so much. And I'll start out by looking at film from this preseason, which we're not going to be able to show all 22s because I don't think they give you all 22s for the preseason. But it's still a really good view of this play. And I think it was a national TV game. It was a Monday Night Football game where – uh, you know, I think a lot of people probably saw it and was the kind of the announcement that he's back, right? So it's this carry against Jacksonville where there's a jump cut there at the line. I mean, you can roll that back and look at that jump cut again. Oh. I just don't think that's a cut that very many players 220 pounds make. The defensive end has him no. and just doesn't have him. That's rare. It's, it's rare. It's something else, man. And it's not just a combination of lateral quickness. It's also a matter of vision. You know, I think Doug Martin has really good vision. And then just the way he finishes off the run, that's Malik Jackson that he runs over. And granted, okay, we're looking at it right there. Like, Malik Jackson's off balance. It's not like he's running straight forward into Doug Martin. But 220 f- pounds is 220 it, pounds. I mean, that's right. You f- you forget that he's, he's squat, but it, Ray, the best of Ray Rice is how I always think of Doug Martin is this very squat, compact, but thick, heavy. And when you see him knock over Malik Jackson like that, I mean, that's... I, I always saw a taller MJD. Okay. That, that was who I, anytime I watch right. him, because he makes these these cuts. And it's not like it's, you know, LaShawn McCoy cuts. No. But for somebody his size, for somebody with his girth, I mean, they, they shouldn't be able to move like that. And he's still got the power. He's still got... It's not like game-breaking long speed, but he's still got long speed. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's... Physically, he's everything you want. And uh, God, I love him when he's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. He's uh, not always healthy, but very, very good. All right, so here's one. This is week 13 last year against the Chargers. And Denzel Perriman makes a nice play and sort of sniffs out the play. And Martin just avoids, like, again, the vision. If you roll that back, you see uh, the vision to kind of see through a block in a way, you know, Perriman stands up the offensive lineman and knows where Martin's coming. And the, just the awareness to see, all right, well, this hole that I think I'm headed to isn't quite a hole. I need to adjust on the fly. And you can see he, there, he goes to the left. And yeah, when, he, when he bends it back and steps through that ankle tackle, I and mean, that's just, that's pure balance right there. Right. It just, another thing, just how balanced he is. Right. The, the vision to, know that okay my blocker didn't do his job entirely so i need to make an he's supposed to run straight there he makes just a quarter turn adjustment and that's not a move that a lot of running backs have in their arsenal unless they're really small unless they're real unless they're LaShawn McCoy type player yeah. and to see him make that adjustment and then to have the power to go through an ankle tackle that a lot of backs wouldn't and then like just kind of be like you said to kind of be off balance through the rest of the run but still have the vision to weave through a couple more tacklers like this is not a sexy run but it's the kind of thing that I don't think a lot of backs do and you know for me the the number one ability for running back in terms of what separates the elite backs from the good backs 
is can you create for yourself? Mm-hmm. If a play is not blocked right, if you've got you know, Melvin Ingram darting inside and forcing you to bend it back and you got a linebacker in your face, can you make a miss? You know, it, it, it's what separates the Doug Martins from the Jaquiz Rogers, you know, the starters from the backups. Can you make people miss? Can you run with balance and power and kind of bounce your way 15 yards down the field and get your offense moving? You know, that's that's rare. It's yeah. rare. It's why it's why when he's healthy, he's a top five running back. In terms of if I'm going to judge talent, I think you're I think he probably is still for me a top five running back. I've always just really liked, liked him. Let's do one more Doug Martin. And it's a similar I'm going to make a similar point. It's against the Cowboys a game. Tampa should have won and the Cowboys come back and uh, and win late. And this is a run that goes off to the right side. And again, it's just a, a mid run adjustment. This is not yeah. exactly like a zone block play, and he almost treats it like he's so talented laterally that he can treat it like it's a zone block play. Like, oh, that's not my hole? Okay, that's my hole. Like, yeah. to bounce it outside like that is... It's a, if it's a if you can put your foot in the ground right. and get from one lane to another instantly, uh, that's... That, that's that's what makes the difference between a play working and a not because you know, most run plays they're not going to be blocked perfectly it's very right. rare that you find plays that just get blocked absolutely perfectly unless you're Ezekiel Elliott then it happens all the time <laughs> but you know on, on the zone run it, like if you're pressing outside and I'm looking at it like they got force they've got the B gap covered they got the A gap covered Sean Lee's getting over the top they got a linebacker coming on block to the back side that's Hitchens I mean, right. yeah I mean yeah. he's it, it it's not there and then it is and he right. has the eyes and the discipline that when he's seeing that coming backside and he's ready to bend it back. But when he sees that a gap open up and he puts his foot in the ground, boom, and just yeah. gets there. That's, that's right. Rare. <laughs> and, and again, you would say like, okay, so on that play Hitchens isn't, I mean, he's got momentum going the sort of sideways and not straight toward Martin. So it's not a perfect tackling situation for him. It would have been a good play to tackle him for a loss, but how many running backs when he makes that cut to the right there, have the, in one step, it's the acceleration that maybe I'm also not emphasizing, that one step where he goes, all right, well, Hitchens is to my left. I better adjust a little bit. I'm not going upfield. I'm going to the right. And the that, I don't think there are many running backs, especially 220 pounds, who can push off with one foot like that in one stride, kind of turn his shoulders and just be away from Hitchens just a little bit, and boom, you, I, you can't tackle me. And whatever, it's an eight-yard gain, but it very well could have been a loss. Yeah, because he, he's squared up on him. You know, mm-hmm. he, he's squared up. He sees that flash of white jersey in front of him, and that's and it. Boom. That's, that's, that's all it took for him to just put his foot in the ground and say, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, And stuff. luckily his center kind of opened it up for him. But, God, that's – ugh, his <laughs> tape is just so nasty, man. It's so nasty. <laughs> he's really good. I mean, it's just a combination <laughs> of speed and quickness, and people have never really understood why I've had such a such an affinity for him as a fantasy draft pick. And, um uh, you know, this year I'm a little bit out of love because of the circumstances, but I certainly am not out of love because of the tape. No, he will always be one of my favorites on tape. Whether or not he's he's healthy, whether or not he's suspended for drugs or anything like that, the dude can just friggin' play. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, good. like that, that's that's the number one thing I look for is just can you play? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, let's move on to our wide receiver, mm-hmm. uh, Stephon Diggs, who's the number one in Minnesota. He had a a great rookie year and then uh was playing through a groin injury last year which really really hampered him uh you could tell it affected him he suffered it early in the season it kind of stayed with him the whole year but he is fully healthy now he's got 4-4 speed he's got great hands he's an excellent route runner he's got great lateral quickness he can make plays after the catch and uh, a lot of people are comparing him i'm not saying that he is this but a lot of people see a young antonio brown in Mm. stefan diggs and I, I don't completely disagree. The question okay. would be is if he's getting the same number of targets and he's getting the same level of quarterback play that Antonio Brown gets. What is your opinion? So I don't see quite that level of springiness and quickness that because I mean Antonio Brown's the quickest receiver in the league probably. So it's maybe too highest high of a standard, right? But I am certainly very impressed and. Uh, I'm, you know, I, on my show, people have heard, you know, me, me do flag players where I'm picking 10 players to plant my flag on and say, you know, value wise relative to where the market is on them. I'm going to own them a lot and I'm willing to sort of stick my neck out on them. And Diggs very much makes the list this year. So 
most of them would agree with what you're saying, but let me throw this wrench into the works because this is now the thing that everybody's talking about when it comes to Diggs and Adam Thielen, which is this preseason. Does this concern you, Brett? Because this preseason, you've seen a lot more of Thielen in the slot and Diggs out wide, where last year, what's the number? 63% slot or something like that? He spent a lot of time in the slot. Thielen was there, there. It's kind of it's, it's weird because he's not like game breaking speed, but he was still a good deep threat, and I have no idea how, mm. but he, but he was, you know, he's, he just always found a way to to find himself open. He was stemming his routes well, you know. Bradford was throwing him open, so he's using leverage well downfield, and it was odd, like you know, they were throwing bombs to him, and it was working. Mm. But this year they're they're kind of flipping that philosophy. Maybe it's just because Diggs has more raw speed. And so maybe they feel like he'll take the the actual top off the defense, whereas Thielen works more as a kind of possession receiver. So I, I guess they want to flip the roles a little bit. I'm not saying it can't work, but I felt like Diggs was a great asset in the slot. So maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. I mean, he's, he's going to get targets regardless. It's just a matter of what kind of targets he's getting, whether it's nine routes or, or slants. But yeah, I don't know. They're, they're, their offense is intriguing to me. Yeah, I mean, the offensive line needs to get better, no question. I, I assume that it probably couldn't be worse, so it's, I think it's probably better. Let's look at a play. That, so the, I'm going to call week two against the Packers from last year, the Stephon Diggs game. That was when they opened the new stadium. It was a <laughs> yeah. national TV game, Sunday night game, and Chris Collinsworth just couldn't get enough of Stephon Diggs. Rightly so. He played unbelievable. Probably I got two plays for you from this game, but I'll start with this one. And I th- the reason I'm going to start with this one is because he actually lines up on the outside. So for the folks who are freaking out about the possibility of Diggs being on the outside more, here he is on the outside. And there is a move that he makes. He's So Marius Randall, the corner here, is cheating to the inside. Sort of knows that uh, something skinny post, something slanty, something to the inside is coming. And he's right. He's guessed right. And Diggs sees this mid-route about, what, 10 yards down the field. And at that point, he goes, all right, I'll go around you. I don't think there are a lot of receivers who can do that. Mm-mm. Who can swim move Mm-mm. over a guy on the run, go, go as if he's going to the outside. And I mean, it's just unfair what he does to him. Cause at that point, if you're even, you're leaving and it's a touchdown. Yeah. And he's got legit, legit four, four speed. Right. And so just to see, just to see the defender kind of guess, right. <laughs> you know, and you still, yeah. you still have his number. Yeah. Well, that's pretty rare, actually. You don't see that a lot. I, I don't think that ball maybe shouldn't have been thrown, but given that it was, I mean, he trusted Diggs' speed, I guess. But to see a, a, a skinny post, an in-breaking route, where the defender is in, he puts his arm around him, swims around him to the outside like that, and still is able to be even and then leaving, uh, you know, that's a very impressive that, touchdown. Th- those are the kind of plays where it, it all comes down to one thing. I'm better than you. Yeah, <laughs> that's, well, that's just it. it's true. Even, yeah. yeah, it's like even if you're right, I will make you wrong. Yeah, that's that's what his natural ability can do. The fact that he was a fifth round pick in the draft, by the way, is astonishing to me. Someone with his physical skill set, his route running ability. I, I, if he played at Alabama, he'd be a first round pick. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, he was a five star recruit. He was one of the top recruits in the entire country. And he went to Maryland and he disappeared because it's Maryland and they're a terrible team overall. But yeah. he was one of the best receivers in the nation. If he was in a winning program in college, he would have been a first-round pick. He would have come in with a ton of hype. In his rookie year, he probably would have you know, been considered one of the hot new things in the league. And he, he kind of got forgotten about. And I think as a fantasy player, that's good for me because that yeah. means that he's not on everybody's mind. And I can get this kind of physically freaky player, this this polished player – you know, in the middle rounds of a fantasy draft and have him be a high upside wide receiver too. I like I'm it. okay with that. And and tough too. Let's look at a, a game against the Colts. This is uh, week 15 later in the year. And uh, probably part of why he falls in the NFL draft is just the measurables are, are very good, maybe not overwhelming at the combine. And then he's six feet, 190, whatever pounds. Like he's little. So people go, okay, well, what is he? Is he just another... Julian Edelman is he just another slot guy right which yeah. I think we think he's not uh and here's an example of just him being a tough dude now the Vikings are getting killed in this game I think at this point in the fourth quarter it's 34-3 and they just run a little game where the two receivers are crossing and Darius Butler comes up and that's mm. a shot gotta wrap up right well okay so it's <laughs> a bad tackle up. right right so it's a bad tackle but the fact that a 190 pound guy can take that kind of shot and not leave his feet 
exactly. That's, that's he, that, he got lit up. Right, and kept going. And to see him, uh, th- you know, fine, this is probably a similarly sized person, maybe a slightly bigger person with a 20-yard head start ahead of steam to come up and hit him like that. Like, yeah. bad tackle, that's... but tough. Like, tough little dude. I think that shows up again and again, that for a six foot, 190 whatever pound tough kid. Mm-hmm. And, he, you know, he could tell, you know, I, I'm i watching the broadcast angle of it as well. And, you know, he's walking back to the huddle and you could tell like in his face, he's just kind of thinking, OK, that really hurt. <laughs> but don't show anything. <laughs> don't move your face muscles at all. Just right. Suck it in. <laughs> <laughs> right. But to stay on your feet. I mean, I think it's good stuff. You know, I wanted yeah. to show I just wanted to show the idea that for the for the sense that he can't play on the outside. I mean, that's not a play where he, he runs on the outside, right? But for the for the idea that he can't play on the outside, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't want him taking that shot all the time. <laughs> it just but, means that, you know, he can he can work from the boundary. He's not just exclusively a boundary threat. You know, you can work him over the middle on third and seven, and, you know, he's he's not going to flinch when the ball's coming at him. That's, right. my, that's my favorite quality about Julian Edelman, who I got an episode coming out for him in the next couple of days, is Julian Edelman's insane. Mm. He's absolutely insane. Like he will go over the middle and he is fearless. Right. That's what you want from your, from your receiver on third down quarterbacks. And there's one time I was talking about Kurt Warner about this. And he said, the reason why he loved throwing to Larry Fitzgerald on third down wasn't just because he had great hands. It's because he didn't care if he got hit. Yeah. He did not care. And more often than not, quarterbacks are going to throw to the guy who is the most fearless rather than the guy who's the most reliable. Because, you know, the fearless guy is going to make every effort he can to catch the ball, and that's Stephon Dix. He does not care if he gets hit. He's going to attack the ball. He's going to bring it in. And more often than not, he's going to convert the first down. That's why I love him. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, here's a Cowboy uh, game highlight where it's just about uh, fluidity. It's a bubble screen, so it's not not a big gainer or anything like that. But just get a sense of ball skills in even on a short pass and I just love the way he turns so the the th- like he turns to catch it and pirouettes you see just mm. not not a good throw <laughs> right so Sam Bradford not I don't think all that great a quarterback usually better than that when he's throwing short but just to see him realize there's a chance that if the defense reads yeah. this right I'm turning my back to the defense like you can see right there I'm turning mm-hmm. my back to the defense to catch this. And I, you know, reaches up behind him, very soft hands, pirouettes. It's the kind of play that when a running back makes that reception, you go, oh man, he's David Johnson. Oh man, he's Le'Veon Bell. He's so smooth. And the point is that you talked about polish earlier. This is the kind of polished play you expect out of the five, six, seven year veteran. The He's just smooth. It's, everything Stevon Diggs is, does is smooth. He, he plucks the ball. That's another yeah. thing I like about him. You know, he, he doesn't let it into his body. He, he, he puts his hands out in front of him. He puts it in the diamond. He attacks the ball so that he gets it in his hands as fast as possible. And then he secures it to his body. There's a lot of receivers that make mistakes, you know, whether it's on screens or whether it's going over the middle, they let the ball get into their body, which means they're not actually securing it into their hands by the time they're being contacted by a defender. You know, they're trying to pin it to them, which a, you're running the risk of it just bouncing off your pads. You're not going to catch the ball anyway. But B, if you're not securing the ball in your hands before you bring it into your body, which is where the defender's arm is coming across your chest, you have to secure the ball before the ball is there mm-hmm. or else it's going to be incomplete. Right. The fact that Stephon Diggs plucks the ball, that's what I love about him. That's why his catch rate's so good. Well, and so then we're going to have the, the, true, the, the, the true indication of what you just said. So I cheated a little by showing a screen pass because it's less difficult to, to, to – uh snatch the, the screen pass this is this is the play of the year for Diggs, and we're going back to the packer game this is uh he's running out of the slot it's kind of just a go route i mean it's a i guess it's a little bit of a post but not not really i think he sort of adjusts on the fly and it's a deep ball just throw it deep sam and he's got two guys on him and talk about snatching god the ball. <laughs> God. About, like, okay, I get it that you could show anybody's best play of the year. That's and just think, showing off, dude. That's <laughs> showing off. So, like, that's a lot of trust, right? That's not bad coverage. That's not a bad play by the safety no, coming it's over. it's not bad coverage at all. <laughs> no, and and uh, just – I think what stands out to me most – well, what stands out to me most is the hands. You talked about the snatching – you know, this is now a 30, 40 yard ball in the air that he's able to just snatch like it's nothing. But also oh once God. he realizes the ball's in the air, there's definitely another gear. He oh, yeah. says, oh, out the, out, I got to go out there. OK, I can get there. 
Like, yeah. and he just puts his head like, down I, and I goes back. Goes, goes well, keep mind, this, is, again. this is before his groin injury, too. Right. This is before his groin injury when he was when he was at max speed. And this is what people thought they were going to get all season. You know, and it's unfortunate that we didn't get it all season because, I mean, the dude can fly. Yeah. You saw he just he ran right by the corner. Yeah. And and the and the safety and the safety can't get over like that's a good oh. play he doesn't know where the ball is going like he got there there's that should not have been a complete pass and Bradford to his credit puts it in a place where nobody's going to catch it but Diggs but probably nobody should have caught it and the fact yeah. that he gets there and basically catches the back half of the ball before it hits the ground it's a pretty great play I'm not saying he's the a Deshaun Jackson kind of deep threat because nobody is but that's what that's what Deshaun does you know he the ball's in the air and he'll run under it. Right. You know, he's not waiting for the ball to get to him. He he goes to the ball. Yeah, that's and, that's uh, for sure. That's God, crazy. he's just he's so good. He's <laughs> so good and so undervalued. And I'm very jealous of the Vikings for getting this kind of talent in the fifth round. I mean, they might have legitimately got the best wide receiver in that class in the fifth round. Remind me who was in that class? The one that I would very easily put above him is Amari Cooper, just because Cooper's been healthy, very productive, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but you know you expect Amari Cooper to be better than everybody. And but I have to, and pick. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but I have to say, like, I actually think they're in the same ballpark in in terms of skills, in terms of polish, oh, in terms. Absolutely. I think Cooper's a little bit better version of Diggs. But if you're getting a discounted version of Amari Cooper six rounds later, you should be paying attention. That's, it's amazing the fact that you can get somebody who's in the conversation with Amari Cooper right that late in the draft is amazing. Right. And he's very easily better than all these names that were drafted in front of him. Kevin White. Who's been hurt, so yeah. you can kind of give him a little pass, but right. I wasn't really that high on it in the first place anyway. The fact that he got drafted in the top 10 was kind of amazing to me, but right. Diggs is easily a better investment. Devontae Parker, starting to look really good. Mm-hmm. Starting to look really good now, but I'd say it took him a little bit longer to get here than Diggs, and who knows if his connection with Cutler is going to be what I think it's going to be. I think he's going to have a great year, but I would say that Diggs has been good for longer than Parker definitely healthier as well. Nelson Aguilar dropped him as prime. Not really much else to be said about him. Brashad Perriman can't stay healthy. People don't even know if he exists. Philip Dorsett can't stay healthy. Uh, Devin Smith couldn't stay healthy. Dorio Green Beckham is on his third team now, I think. Mm. And Devin well, he's, not a, he's not on any team right now. Yeah. Is he not on any team? Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, there you go. Yeah. Dev, and these, I'm still in the top of the second round, by the way. There's a lot of receivers drafted that aren't as good as Diggs. Devin Funches, more of a red zone target. I guess you can consider him the number four option in the past game now, now that Christian McCaffrey's there. Yeah, we'll pass on him. Yeah, agreed. Tyler Lockett, great player. Hasn't really found a big role in the offense yet. I love him as a player, though. Me too. It sucks that he got hurt last year. Yeah. He's a good player. Jalen Strong has not become what we thought he would be yet. He's the number four receiver in Houston at best. Uh, Chris Conley is a number two in Kansas city and still hasn't really done that much. Sammy Coates is a backup. Ty Montgomery is a, <laughs> is a running, running back. back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jameson Crowder. I'll give you Jameson Crowder. But not, great... a, not against Stephon Diggs. I, I would take not Diggs every Stephon day. Diggs. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Jameson Crowder. He's not Stephon Diggs, but I do love Jameson Crowder. Yeah. Justin Hardy. Again, good player. Not Stephon Diggs. Vince Mayo, is he even on the Browns anymore? I don't think he's in the league, no. He DeAndre was in the Cowboys Smelter, briefly, yeah. yeah. DeAndre Smelter was a fourth-round pick from Georgia Tech where he caught, like, what, five passes a year? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> yeah, he's – I don't even know if he's on the Niners anymore. I don't think he is. Rashad Green, he's a backup slot receiver. And then you get Stephon Diggs. Yeah. All those names ahead of him. All those names. Yeah. And, and they get an, a legitimate number one receiver at the 146th overall pick. That is good drafting. It is. I mean, in in retrospect, I didn't necessarily expect much from him. Uh, if you had him as a as a great pro prospect, I definitely didn't. So that's a good call by you. It's in average drafts right now on Fantasy Football Calculator a new way. Diggs basically goes it goes Diggs then Parker in the 6th round. 6th 6th 7th round. So they're back to back right now. And I think there's a lot of people who would say that's crazy. A lot of a lot of wise guys who I do drafts with who say it's crazy. Devontae Parker has A.J. Green upside. What's Stephon Diggs going to be? And if he's 85% of Antonio Brown, that's plenty. And it, and it feels like yeah. he's closer to arriving than Parker, for sure. I think I have Diggs. I think I have him as a fifth-round pick, and I think I have Parker as a third-round pick. Oh, so but that's like mostly – okay. well, I had Parker, actually, ironically enough, as my number one wide receiver in that draft class, uh, slightly above Amari Cooper. I think he's incredibly physically talented, uh, and – 
the only reason I have him ahead of Diggs is because I think he's going to get a ton of usage in the red zone. I don't think Diggs is going to get as much red zone work. I think he's going to do more of his damage in between the 20s and on long balls and everything like that, uh, which in a PPR league, I mean, you could you could argue Diggs over most receivers because I think he's going to catch at least 90 passes. But if you're in a standard league where touchdowns really do matter, I I definitely would go Parker just because he has that that red zone utility. I have Diggs. It's I have Diggs over Parker. Than... I feel great though. I feel great about that. I'll tell you why. Because with Doug Martin, I did not live to my, I didn't I didn't live up to my own standards like you did. But with Diggs, ah, I'm eating it, man. I'm gonna eat Stephon Diggs all day long. Stephon Diggity. <laughs> I I won't argue against it. Yeah. I won't argue against it. I I feel like at the end of the day, they're both gonna put up wide receiver two numbers. I think that's that's a given. And I honestly, if, if you were going to draft Diggs before the fifth round, I wouldn't really complain. Hmm. Um, I think they're both wide receiver twos, no matter what. It's just a matter of the fact that I think Parker is going to score, whereas Diggs is going to get yards. Mm-hmm. And so your league scoring system, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever your league scoring system is, just draft according to that. Because right. you, you really can't go wrong either way, unless Jay Cutler gets hurt again, which you're kind of screwed. Uh, but it's not like Sam Bradford's a picture of health either. So whichever quarterback stays healthy the longest, go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so get in your time machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of good value in this year's draft. You know, not just Diggs and not just Martin. That's I don't think, you know, there's a lot of people panicking about the, the running back depth and everything like that. But if you know who to target and you can work yourself into a favorable position in the mid rounds, you don't have to nail your first round pick. You know, you can take somebody safe. And even if they don't finish as the top you know, three person of their position. If they finish sixth, as long as you draft in the mid rounds, okay, you're going to be fine. Right. So people need to, to kind of just chill out. Don't panic. If you don't get David Johnson or Le'Veon Bell, there are other running backs. If you don't get Mike Evans or OBJ, there are other receivers. Just don't panic. You'll be fine. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for joining me. This was, this was wonderful. I love collaborating with you. I love just having somebody that I can actually watch tape with and, and gush <laughs> over Martin and Diggs, two of my favorite players. Somebody to spread the gospel of Martin and Diggs. Uh, this was a, a load of fun. I encourage everybody to check out the Harris Football Podcast. All of his opinions are based on tape, where he does he just does this all day. He does this all day and comes up with opinions. I do. And I, I feel like that's a lot more reliable than numbers, because at the end of the day, numbers lie. People draft on numbers every single year, and they get burned every single year. If you draft on tape, more often than not, you're going to do okay. So check out the Harris Football Podcast. He'll set you up right. Thank you very much for coming on again. I really appreciate it. This was a ton of fun, and I hope you can come back soon. Oh, it was great. I'd be glad to come on any time. It's really fun. Uh, you know, the point about numbers is that, I mean, we look at numbers some, right? We all look at numbers some, but it's just not hard to look at numbers. It doesn't take very long. The film takes a long time to watch, which is why a lot of yes. people poo-poo it, because it occupies so much of our day. Uh, I don't think there are really film-only guys. I think there are stats-only guys, and then there are film and stat guys, right? And and having the film to fall back on is it is uh, extraordinarily important to understand what they look like. I agree with you 100%. The all 22 will never lie to you. That's why I love it. <laughs> Thank you for having me on, though. It was really fun. I'm glad. If, if folks want to check it out, um, on Twitter, at Harris Football. Thank you. And I'll see you guys uh, next week when I'm doing my season predictions. And I've got a very special project coming out related to daily fantasy football that you guys are going to love, too. So I will see you guys next week. Until then, later. <laughs>